Okay then, so this time I want to talk about polarities. So a polarity is essentially a kind of correlation which is going to send lines to points and points to lines, but it's a special kind of correlation which has a period of two. In other words, if you apply this correlation twice to any element, that will return that element to itself. So a point will get mapped some line, but that line will get mapped back to the original point again if you apply the operation again. So these polarities have a lot of applications because essentially they're really highlighting this kind of duality that occurs between points and lines. And also, as we shall see, conics are extremely closely related to polarities. So this is a very interesting idea we'll be getting onto in a future lecture, how conics induce special kinds of polarities, which send, for example, points on the outside of a conic to lines on the inside of a conic and vice versa, etc. Now, for today, we're just going to talk about polarities in a more abstract way. So I want to do this rigorously. So I've introduced a little bit of notation. Uh, this is my own notation. Um, hopefully you won't find it too confusing. I'm a graph theorist really by, by most training. So I like to think of things this way because it reminds me how projectivities are really quite similar to isomorphisms in graph theory. And so, basically, what we'll do then, we'll suppose that we have a set bold type P and bold type L of points and lines, respectively, in our projective plane. And what we're going to do, this is the sort of new part, is that for an element alpha, which might be a point or a line, we're going to introduce this idea of a neighborhood of alpha. So that's just the set of all elements of the opposite type to what alpha has, which alpha is touching. So if alpha is a line, then neighborhood of alpha is the set of all points on that line. And if alpha is a point, then neighborhood of alpha is the set of all lines through that point. So it's essentially the set of all stuff that's touching alpha, which has a type that's different to alpha, where a type is either point or line. So, basically then, um, a projectivity is just a, a mapping which is going to preserve this relationship of when a given element is, a neighbor, is in the neighborhood of another element. So, um, if something's touching something before, it's touching something afterwards, and if it's not touching something before, then it's not touching something after the projectivity is applied. So that's in general, but we're talking about polarities. So a polarity is a special kind of projective correlation. So let me just remind you what a projective correlation is. A projective correlation is a projectivity which acts as a bijection from the set of points P to the set of lines L and from the set of lines L to the set of points P so it's essentially interchanging those two well the elements in those two sets um, and it has this property then that um, two things are touching each other before the mapping if and only if they're touching each other after the mapping where those things have different types um, and then a polarity is a projective correlation which has period two. So um, this idea of periods is quite a common one when one's talking about mappings which are repeatedly applied. So the period of a point is the minimum number of times greater than one, greater than zero that you have to apply the mapping to return a point to itself. So fixed points have period one. If something returns to itself after you do the operation twice and, not, and it's not fixed, then it has period two and so forth. So 
if you have an operation, say, which um, moves a point to the point clockwise adjacent to it on a triangle, well, that'll have period three because you have to apply it three times to return a triangle vertex to itself. So then a polarity is just a projective correlation which has period two. So it's as I said before, it's just a projective correlation which basically swaps lines and points around as bijections whilst preserving this kind of touching property. So it's like that, but it has period two. So whenever you apply this operation twice, it will return any, any element to itself. Any line or point gets mapped to itself under two applications. So since this has the nice property um, of being period two, we can introduce some special notation. So one piece of notation, which I don't use that much, but it's still quite useful to know, is this perp symbol. So if we have an element alpha, which might be a, a line or a point, then alpha perp is just going to be the image of alpha under our polarity. So if alpha is a point, then alpha perp will be the line which that point gets sent to. And if alpha is a line, then alpha perp will be the point. Also, I should just... Uh, so sometimes we'll refer to alpha perp as the dual of alpha. Now, I should also take this time to introduce a little bit of extra terminology. So... In particular, if we have a, a point, well, we'll typically denote a point by a capital letter. So um, maybe we have a point A. Say, so this isn't written down, I'm just telling you this. So then we'll refer to the, the sort of dual of capital A as A perp, capital A perp. And we'll sometimes write that as lowercase a. So lowercase a denotes line. This is the kind of convention I've been trying to stick with throughout. So lowercase a will, will denote a line, but we're going to use some extra... Um, we're going to imbue our letters with extra meaning. So in general, we're going to think of lowercase a as the dual of uppercase A. So not only does lowercase a denote a line, that line is actually the dual of capital A. In fact, we've got a special name for it. We call it the polar. So the dual of a point is called the polar of that point. That's a line. And conversely, the dual of a line is called the pole of that line. So a good way to think of it is that the word pole is shorter than the word polar and a point is called a pole which is a shorter object than a line which is called a polar. So the dual of a point is the polar of that point and the dual of a line is the pole of that line. So that's pretty much all the notation we'll need um, and so we can get on to our first result. Oh no, no, I tell a lie. There is just a little bit more notation we're going to need. And that is that we're going to be talking about when two elements are conjugates to one another. So, say we have a couple of elements of the same type, alpha and beta. And let's say that alpha is touching the dual of beta. So, for example, we might have two points, alpha and beta. And it might be true that the point alpha actually lies upon the polar line of beta. That would be one example. So in such a case, we say that alpha and beta are conjugates to one another. So two things are conjugates when one thing is touching the dual of the other thing. And also, an even more special relationship which occurs quite rarely, is for a, an element to be self-conjugate. 
and that's when it's touching its own jewel. So a self-conjugate point is a point which lies upon its own polar. And a self-conjugate line is a line which goes through its own pole. Okay? So our first result then is a restriction upon when these self-conjugate points can actually occur. And what it says is that if we have a couple of distinct self-conjugate points, A and B, then their join, as in the line that joins them, AB, cannot be a self-conjugate line. So the join of two self-conjugate points can't be a self-conjugate line. How do we prove this? Well, what we're going to do, let's suppose that this line, which joins A and B, let's call that little e, lowercase e. So we're just going to suppose kind of falsely that this is actually a self-conjugate line. Now, A and B are distinct. So A and B can't both be equal to the pole e perp of this line e. So we might as well suppose that B is not equal to the pole e perp of this line e. Okay, now the fact that e is the join of A and B means that B belongs to the range of E, obviously. Or if you like, B belongs to the neighborhood of E. Now, just looking at the dual of this argument, we see that this means that the the perpendicular or the perp of B has to belong to the neighborhood of the perp of E. In other words, the polar of point B has to go through the pole of line E. So what that means then is, another way of saying it essentially, is that the pole of point E has to belong to the range of the polar, sorry, the um, pole of line E has to belong to the range of the polar of point B. In other words, E perp belongs to the neighborhood of B perp. Now, we're also assuming that B is going to be a self-conjugate point. And that means that B has to belong to the neighborhood of B perp. It has to belong to the pencil of its pole. So the thing is though, since we're assuming that the pole of line E is not equal to B, well, what this means is we've just shown that this point B belongs to the belongs to the range of the polar of B. And we've just shown that the pole of E belongs to the range of the polar of B. So we've got these two distinct points which both lie upon the range of the polar of this um, of this point B. So we've got these two points upon this line B perp. So we can just then write that B perp is just equal to the join of these two points. In other words, B perp equals E perp joined with B. So, in fact, what we're going to have now is that these three points, A, B, and E perp, they're going to be three collinear points. And since A is not equal to B, we can actually just rewrite the equation for the polar of B in that polar of B is just going to be equal to AB. So it's just going to be equal to our original line E. But now we see our contradiction because now what we've essentially shown is that E is going to be the, the polar of B. But we also know that E is going to be the polar of E perp.
And since B is not equal to E pair, that just doesn't make sense because the polar of something is uniquely defined. So it's impossible that E could be the polar of E perp and the polar of B. So um, that's just a contradiction, which means that our original assumption that our line E is self-conjugate must be false. Okay, so our next result is yet another restriction upon the occurrence of these kind of self-conjugate points. So what it says is that there's actually no line which contains more than two of these self-conjugate points. So the proof of this result is fairly interesting because it uses quite a few different ideas, such as the notion of harmonic conjugates, and also one of our big axioms of projective geometry that um, a non in a non-fixed projective one-dimensional projectivity can't have more than two fixed points so essentially we're going to do a construction we're going to suppose that we begin with a couple of self-conjugate points capital P and capital Q on the line lowercase c. Now I noticed that my my um, some of my capital letters, in particular my P's and my C's and my S's, tend to look quite a lot like my lowercase letters. So I've underlined the capitals. So P underlined means capital P, S underlined means capital S, etc. And the meaning of these upper and lowercase letters is that the for example, the lowercase p means the polar of the point uppercase p, and vice versa, the lowercase, sorry, the uppercase p means the pole point of the line lowercase p. So, essentially, the case of the letters denotes, um, well, if two letters are the same apart from whether or not they're capitalized, that means they're either identical elements or one's the dual of the other. And um, capitalized letters are points or poles, and lowercase letters are lines or polars. Okay, so essentially to create this, we start with a couple of self conjugate points P and Q on this line C. You can see on this diagram here. And so that implies that we're going to have a couple of polars, lowercase p and lowercase q, which are going to go through this point, capital C. And what we're going to do then is just add some extra elements to this and create a construction with some quadrangles. So in particular, let's suppose that we have another point, capital R, on this line lowercase p. And we'll suppose that that point's distinct from capital C and capital P. Now, what that means is that the, the polar of this line, well, the polar of this line, which is little r, that is going to meet this line little q somewhere. So we can suppose that it does meet it at this point capital S. And this point capital S is going to have a polar which is going to be joined, which is going to be obtained by joining points Q and R because capital S itself is the meeting point of lines little Q and little R. So its polar is going to be the join of points capital Q and capital R. And finally, well, not finally, but let T be the join, sorry, be the meeting point of lowercase r and lowercase s. And then, of course, the polar of T, little t, is going to be the join of points capital R and capital S. And also, two more things left. So we're going to have the point B 
is going to be equal to their meeting point of lines little c and little t and um, the polar of b little b is then going to be just the join of points capital C and capital T sorry it's going to be the line between points capital C and capital T and finally we're going to have this point A which is going to be equal to the meeting point of the lines little b and little c so hopefully you can see all this in the diagram that I've drawn essentially the idea here is that we're starting off with this line C, little c, and we have these two self-conjugate points P and Q. And now what we want to do is to show that these are the only two self-conjugate points on this line. So in this pink box here, I've just summarized the sort of definitions of these different elements as I've just described them. And so what we want to do to start with is to show that A and B are actually going to be distinct points on this line lowercase c. So the thing is, you should be able to see by this quadrangle which we've drawn with vertices C, S, T, R, that A is actually the harmonic conjugate of B with respect to P and Q. Because P and Q are a couple of diagonal points on this line. And A and B are then the other two points which you get from this complete quadrangle. Which both pass through this third diagonal point which is essentially the place where the line joining vertices R and S meets the line joining vertices C and T. So these other two lines through that third diagonal point cross this line C at A and B, so they're going to be harmonic conjugates to one another with respect to the points P and Q. Now, a couple of important points to note, which... I don't think are initially obvious, but I've I've proved them here. Uh, firstly, is that we can't have B equals Q because we defined point R, so the point R is not equal to point C. That was one of our stipulations. But it should be noted that if B equals Q, then that actually implies that R equals C. So in particular, if capital B equals capital Q, that means that, so I use this double arrow to mean implies, so that implies that little b equals little q. Now, capital T equals the meeting point of little b and little r, and if b equals q, then that's going to be equal to the meeting point of little q, little r, and that's going to be s. So then we have that little c equals little s. And now we're going to have the, the point capital S. Well, that's equal to the meeting point of lines little q and little t. But if little t equals little s, then that's equal to the meeting points of little q, little s, which is equal to q. So now we have the lines little s and little q are equal. And now point R is the meeting point of lines little p and little s. But if little s equals little q, well, that's equal to the meeting point of little p and little q, which is c. So we've shown by quite a long chain of logic that when the points p and q are equal, that's going to infer that the points b and q are equal. Sorry, the points r and c are equal. So, b equals q implies r equals c. And um, that's not allowed because of the way we've defined r. So it can't be that b equals q. And similarly, we have that if b equals p, 
then that infers that R equals P, which again is just not allowed. Because if B equals P, that means that T is going to be equal to R, which means that P is going to be equal to R, which doesn't make sense. You can see by this writing in orange. So, um, since neither of those can be true, we know that point B can equal point Q or point P. Okay? And so now, since we have that P, Q, and B are all distinct points, we can use one of our previous results, which essentially says that when the pair P, Q is harmonic conjugates, harmonic conjugates to the pair B, A, and we have that P, Q, and B are all distinct, well, that actually implies that A and B are distinct from one another. And so that means that B cannot actually be self-conjugate because it doesn't lie upon the line little b. So that's pretty much all the um, kind of pre-argument about harmonic conjugates that we need. Now we can go ahead and prove this result. Okay then, so to finish this proof, let's consider an arbitrary point, capital X, on this line, lowercase c. Now, let's think about the conjugate point to X. We'll call this conjugate point Y. So, in particular, we get this point Y by taking this point, capital X, and then finding its polar, little x, and we just find the place where this polar meets with this line lowercase c, and that gives us this conjugate point y. So, since there's going to be a projectivity from capital X to x, and we have this elementary correspondence from lowercase x to capital Y, there's going to be, then be a projectivity from capital X to capital Y. And so let's think about this projectivity. Well, since we know that these points capital P and capital Q are self-conjugate, that means that they're actually going to be fixed points under this particular projectivity. In other words, if we set our variable point capital X equal to capital P, then um, we're going to have that capital P is also going to be equal to Y. Similarly, if we set Q to be the input, then Q will also be the output. So P and Q are going to be invariant points of this projectivity. So we already have two invariant points. Now, remember from one of our axioms of projective geometry that any one-dimensional mapping that has more than two invariant points has to actually just be the identity. So is our mapping the identity? Well, no, it's not, because we know that there are points A not equal to B, which get essentially interchanged by this projectivity. Um, in particular, we know that when X, capital X equals A, then capital Y is equal to B, which is not A. So that means that our mapping cannot be the identity, but we've already identified two invariant points. So now we've pretty much finished the proof because that means there can't be any more invariant points. If there was another one, then it would just be the identity by our axiom. So we know there can't be any more invariant points and what that translates to is in terms of the original correlation, that means that there can't be any more self-conjugate points than P and Q on this line C. So that essentially completes the proof. P and Q are the only self-conjugate points on the line C. You can't have more than two. Okay, and we also get an interesting connection now. If we look at this diagram a bit more, 
we get an interesting connection between the concept of polarities and involutions. Because in particular, uh, this line C that we have is actually going to work as an involution because it switches around these two points A and B. It sends A to B and it sends B to A. So in other words, if we consider this projectivity again that sends our variable point X to its conjugate point Y, well, that's going to work as a polarity uh, on top of this line C. And that will hold for any line C that's not a self-conjugate line. So it's interesting that we have this relationship between polarities and involutions that allows us to tap into all of the results about involutions that we were discussing previously. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the interesting topic of self-polar triangles. So the central idea here is that sometimes when we do a projective correlation, it's going to send the three vertices of some triangle to the three opposite edges of, of that triangle. So vertex A will be sent to the edge opposite vertex A and so forth. And when that happens, it turns out, according to our next result, that the projective correlation will always be a polarity. So any projective correlation that sends vertices of a triangle to the opposite sides, respectively, is going to be a polarity. So how do we prove this? Well, suppose we have our triangle with vertices capital A, capital B and capital C. And now we're just going to let little a, b and c denote the opposite sides to these vertices. And also we're going to consider some point P that doesn't lie upon any of the sides of our triangle. So now what we're going to do is think about this correlation that sends capital A to little a, big B to little b, big C to little c, and point P to line little p. So since our point capital P doesn't touch any of the edges of the triangle, it follows that this polar, this line little p, is not going to touch any of the vertices A, B and C of our triangle. And in fact, if you think about it, these um, two objects, this point capital P and its polar, the line little p, they're going to determine six extra points on the sides of our triangles. And we'll give those some new names. So in particular, we're going to call capital P subscripts lowercase a. That's going to be equal to the point obtained by joining vertex capital A with point capital P and seeing where that line obtained by joining those vertices cuts through this side little a of the triangle, the side opposite to capital A. So that gives us um, this point P A here. That's capital P lowercase, well, capital P subscript lowercase a, um, if we need to be particularly correct about it. But you can see on the diagram how it's defined. And similarly, we have P of B and P of C. So for example, P of C, to get that, we join capital C and capital P by a line. And we find out where that line cuts through the side little c of our triangle. And similarly, we're going to have A of P. So that's just the point obtained by... Well, it's a point where the line little a and the line little p intersect. And B of P is where the line little b and little p intersect and so forth. So we also have these three points, A of P, B of P, and C of P. So let's just think now a little bit about how our correlation works. So we've already said that it transforms points of the triangle into opposite edges of the triangle. So 
we know that it's going to transform this line, little a, between vertices b and c, into this point, capital A, which is the point that lies on the intersection of lines, little b and little c. Also, if we consider the line which is joining capital A and capital P, well, that's going to get transformed into the meeting point of lines little a and little p. And that's just A of p, according to our notation. And finally, if we consider this point where, well, if we consider the point P of A, which is essentially the place where this line through capital A and capital P meets this line little a, well, just by following our notation, we see that this transforms into Oh, excuse me. Um, this is a point, not a line. So, sorry, if we consider the line P of A, which is just the point where this line little a crosses through this line that joins capital A and capital P, well, that's going to get transformed into this line, which is going to go through capital A and also through this point A of P. So we have these, these different transformations which occur. So now what we're going to do is we're going to consider an arbitrary point X on our line C. And we're going to think about the line, little x, that this point gets transformed into. Now, in a kind of similar way to before, we're going to let capital Y denote the other point on C, which is going to be the sort of conjugate to the point capital X. So since we have our projective correlation from capital X to lowercase x, and an elementary correspondence from lowercase x to y, we're going to have this projectivity from our variable point capital X to its conjugate point y on this line C. And actually, just like before, this is going to work as an evolution on C, actually interchanging the positions of points X and Y. And so our correlation is going to change this point P of C into this point where, into this line, sorry, which goes through this point capital C and also this point C of P. And so what this essentially means is that our involution working on this line C is just going to interchange these points P of C and C of P. So given that it interchanges the two points, it doesn't just send one to the other, it sends the other back to the one. Well, that means that the involution's got to send C of P to P of C. And so our, if we go back to thinking about our original correlation, well, that's got to send point C of P to the point where, the, sorry, to the line, which is obtained by joining P of C and this point capital C. So... In other words, we have that C of P is transformed into the line joining C and P of C. And a little bit of algebra will convince you that that second point is just equal to the line through vertex C and point capital P. So our correlation transforms C of P into CP. And similarly, it's got to transform A of P into AP and B of P into BP, the line through vertex P and vertex B. So now if we consider our line, lowercase p, well, this line has to go through A of P and B of P. And so its image under our 
projective correlation has to be the place where this line through A and P intersects this line through B and P. And that is indeed just the point capital P. So what we've finally shown now is that this transformation not only sends capital P to the line lowercase p, it also sends the line lowercase p to capital P. So that indeed shows that this mapping works as a polarity because it has to be period two because of the way it operates upon this arbitrary point P, transforming P to itself if we apply the mapping twice. Okay, so using the so-called self-conjugate triangles is quite a neat way to often define these polarities. So we have some special notation uh, for this, which is kind of like our our symbols for involutions and such. We write open bracket ABC close bracket, open bracket capital P lowercase p close bracket. And that denotes the polarity which sends the triangle with vertices A, B and C to the opposite edges of that triangle, which will be called lowercase a, lowercase b, lowercase c. And also it sends this point capital P that doesn't lie upon any of the sides of this triangle to this line lowercase p. So we've got a little diagram here and essentially what we can do now using our information about involutions is we can give a give a method of actually calculating the polar of a given point x. And so this isn't actually the simplest method. We'll talk about an even simpler method later of working out the polar of an arbitrary point. But for now, let's just consider this. So we'll have this polarity, which we've just described. And um, let's try and figure out what the image of this point X is under this polarity. So... It turns out if we consider this side A of our triangle, the side opposite to vertex capital A, well, let's think about the involution of that line, which is going to swap around the vertices of our triangle, B and C, and also going to swap around this point P of A and this point A of P. So if we look at that involution, and then we look at this point, which we'll just call x of a, so kind of analogously to uh, p of a, this is just obtained by drawing the line through vertex a and point x and seeing where that line meets the side little a. So if we take this point x of a, well we can figure out what the, the, uh, the mate of this is under our involution. In other words, we can work out what the image is of this point x of a. And let's call that point a of x. And if we define b of x similarly to be the mate of x of b, well, it turns out then that the image of capital X is just going to be equal to the join of a of x and b of x. So you can see from... Uh, a previous lecture how to work out the image of a given of a given point under an involution and using this information twice essentially once on line little a and once on line little b we can find these two points a of x and b of x and their join is just going to be equal to the polar or the image of point x under our polarity so this is one method of figuring out the polar of a given point under a polarity. So, in particular then, just to say it more generally, in particular more generally, that doesn't make, okay, well anyway, more generally, if we just have one of these polarities, uh, written A, B, C, capital P, lowercase p, well, it turns out that the involution of conjugate points 
on this line lowercase p is indeed just this involution which is determined by the quadrangle uh, on vertices capital A, B, C and P for this line little p. So we have this really fundamental connection between polarities and involutions which then goes back to the relationships between involutions and quadrangles. Okay, so now we move on to a famous result of projective geometry called Chasler's theorem. So Chasler was one, of, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, but he was one of the last of the school of great French geometers, um, projective geometers, of which we've discussed many. Um, after him, um, it turned out that a lot of the newer projective geometry results were done in Germany um, by von Stout in particular. But anyway, so Chasles established this remarkable theorem, which is about polar triangles. So a polar triangle is a triangle which is obtained by taking a given triangle and then either taking the polars of its three vertices or perhaps if we're looking at the dual case taking the poles of its three edges but let's consider the primary case I mean the latter will follow by the principle of duality anyway um, so we'll just consider the case of, uh, of the polars of the vertices of a triangle so the question is what do those look like in general well We've just been looking at a case where the polars of the triangle actually form that triangle again, essentially, because the polars correspond to the opposite sides of the triangle. But that need not necessarily be the case. And Charles Less' theorem is essentially that when that is not the case, the polars of the triangle, these three polar lines, they're going to cross the three opposite sides of the triangle at three collinear points. So, more precisely, well, another way to say it is that um, when the triangle and the polar triangle are distinct, in other words, when we don't have this case that the polarity just maps the triangle to itself, well, in the case where, you know, we get distinct objects, then our two triangles have to be perspective in the same um, idea as is used in de Zarg's theorem. So um, more precisely then, if we look at the polars of the vertices of a triangle, and if those polars don't coincide with the opposite sides of a triangle, then those polars are going to meet those sides at three collinear points. That's Charles Less' theorem, theorem. So, what's the proof to Charles Less' theorem? Well, let's consider one of these triangles with vertices P, Q, and R. And so that's going to obviously have sides Q, R, R, P, and P, Q. And um, we're interested in where those three sides intersect with the polars of the vertices which are lowercase p, lowercase q and lowercase r. So let's call those three places the uh, respective intersections of the polars and the opposite sides p1, q1 and r1. So for example p1 is where the polar of vertex p intersects with the opposite side of vertex P. Okay, um, so for example R1 is just going to be where the line through P and Q meets the line lowercase r. And so the polar then of R1, capital R1, is going to be lowercase r1 and that's just going to be equal to the 
line which goes through the place where lines little p and little q intersect and the vertex r. Also, just for the sake of construction, let's define a couple of extra points. A point we'll call P dash, which is the point obtained by drawing a line through capital P and capital Q and finding out where that line intersects with lowercase q. And similarly, we'll define R dash as to be equal to the line obtained by sorry, equal to the point obtained by drawing a line through capital Q and capital R and finding out where that line intersects again with this line little q. And also, just for completion, note that the polar of capital P dash is going to be lowercase p dash and that's going to be the, the line which goes through the point where little p and little q intersect and also the point capital Q. So what we can do now, if you recall way back near the beginning of these lectures, we were talking about how if we have four points, which are collinear, then we can find a polarity which swaps around those points in pairs. So in particular now, if we have a look at this line here, which contains the points R1, P, P dash, and Q. Well, it follows from that result that there's going to be a polarity of that line. Sorry, there's going to be a... Um, did I say polarity? I meant there's always a projectivity that exchanges four collinear points in pairs. So there's going to be this projectivity on this line which sends R1, P, P dash, Q to P, R1, Q, P dash, just swapping round the order of these points in two pairs, the pair of points P and R1 exchange positions and the pair of points Q and P dash exchange positions. Well now, since we have this polarity, there's further going to be a projectivity from these points, P, R1, Q, and P dash, to little p, little r1, little q, and little p dash. So if we now have a look at where these lines, lowercase p, r1, q, and p dash, intersect this line which goes through P1 and R, well, Essentially, what we see is that we have an elementary correspondence now. So, we have a projectivity from lowercase p r1 q p dash to the vertices p1 r r dash and q upon this line through p1 and r. So, we've got this string of projectivities now. And if we look at the combined effect of it, that's essentially a projectivity which sends R1 to P1, P to R, and P dash to R dash. And so it maps three points on one line to three points on the other line. And it also leaves this point Q, where the two lines intersect, invariant. So now, there was another result I discussed when I was talking before about perspectivities. I think in the lecture where, I think it was in the lecture where I talked about the fundamental theorem of projective geometry or thereabouts. Um, and we discussed this idea that when we have a projectivity which sends three collinear points to three collinear points, and also leaves a fourth point invariant, the intersection of those two lines, the one containing the first three collinear and the one containing the second three. Well, in that case, we actually have not just a projectivity, but a perspectivity. So, in other words, we have to have a perspectivity, which is the thing that's sending R1 to P1 
P to R and P dash to R dash. And we can work out what the center of this perspectivity is. So the center of this perspectivity is just the point obtained by joining P and R and finding out where that line intersects with the line obtained by joining P dash and R dash. So that is in fact just the point Q1. So since this is a perspectivity then, we have that this point Q1 has to lie on this line which goes through R1 and P1. So what we've done now is essentially proved that P1, Q1 and R1 are all collinear. So this proves our result um, for the case where our triangle and its polar triangle are distinct. And I'll leave it to you to investigate how this proof actually breaks down in the case where those two triangles are the same. So one of the consequences of Chastles's theorem is that it actually gives us a sort of simpler way of working out the polar of a given point x. So suppose, suppose x is a point which doesn't lie upon the line through capital A and capital P, or the line through capital B or capital P, or the polar little p of big P. So in that case, let's just consider our standard polarity, which we write as a, B, C, and P, little p, in parentheses. So we'll consider how this polarity works. And we're going to try and work out what the polar is of this point capital X. And so what we get now is a, well, it's sort of a consequence of Chastles's theorem, or similar reasoning, <whistles> is that if we have a look at this line, which goes through x1 and x2, um, where x1 and x2 are as defined below, that's actually going to be equal to the polar of our point capital X. So this essentially gives us a method to determine this, um, this polar of capital X. So how do we work out what, this, what these points X1 and X2 are? Well, firstly, let's define A1 to be the intersection point of side A with the line through P and X. And now we'll define P1 as the intersection point of the line little p and the line through capital A and capital X. And now we can just define x1 to be the intersection point of the line through capital A and capital P and the line through capital A1 and capital P1. So similarly, if we define B2 is equal to lowercase b dot px, P, capital P2 is equal to lowercase p dot bx and x2 is equal to bp dot b2 p2. Well, the join of x1 and x2 is just going to be equal to the polar of x. So I'll leave it to you as an exercise to firstly go through this and convince yourself that it works. And secondly, see if you can work out a proof of it based on similar reasoning to as is used in Chastles's theorem's proof. Okay, so there's plenty more I can say about polarities, uh, but in the interest of time, I'll just uh, quickly mention a couple of extra results. So one is that it turns out that any projective collineation can actually be written as the product of two polarities. So it turns out that in general, even if we don't have a polarity, we can always express, as long as it's a co projective collineation, we can always express it as the product of two polarities. And I'll leave it to you to investigate how that works. And another result, which I think is um, 
sort of obvious in a way, but also has some fairly interesting implications, is that in general, if we have one of these projective collineations, well, that's going to be sending points to lines and lines to points. And if we gather together all of the invariant points, all of the fixed points, and all of the fixed lines, well, together those points and lines are going to form a so-called self-dual figure. A figure which is itself, which is its own dual. So, an example of this, which we encounter quite early, is de Zarg's configuration, which you may recall has 10 points and 10 lines in this nice kind of, um, in this nice kind of self-dual drawing. And so it's interesting that we have a source of these self-dual configurations um, just by doing projective collineations and seeing which points and lines are not moved.